Maganda hapon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to our speaker. Uh, welcome to the Bina to the weekly Binalo Talk. So for everyone who's uh, not familiar with the Binalo Talks, this is a weekly talks, informal talks that's uh, hosted by the Archaeological Studies Program. Uh, we invite different people to give talks about their uh, ideas and have a discussion. So it's mostly just discussion. Um, and it, we try not to limit ourselves to archaeology. We try to invite many people, including people from music, arts, um, history, uh, business, maths, and everything. So it's basically just a way for us to talk and have a very informal discussion while we're having lunch. But since this is already, uh, since the pandemic, we've moved online. So, uh, but we've tried to keep the, in, the informalities uh, uh, still a part of it. Uh, on behalf of the Binalo Talks, for everyone who was here last week, uh, we would like to apologize for the uh, inconvenience that happened. Uh, we'll, we've, uh, unfortunately, because of this, uh, we've had to test a lot of the security. So if anyone has any questions, uh, please uh, raise your hand before we will allow you to unmute and uh, start your video. Um, or alternatively, if you don't want to press the reactions button, you can also put in the put your questions on the chat. Or if you're feeling shy, don't hesitate to e to PM me, uh, Anna, or you can also PM Arturo, uh, who is who will be moder who will be co-moderating with me. For any tech issues, uh, feel free to PM me or Ara Ara One. Okay, uh, she's our awesome tech for this day, but. I think uh, we will skip with the announcements and we uh, we will start with the talk. So, okay. Um, let me introduce our speaker. Uh, Dr. Patrick Roberts uh, is a W2 research group leader at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History in uh, Germany. His research applies multidisciplinary approaches to explore the past interactions of our species with forest environments across the tropics from Africa to Australia, and from the first evolution and dispersals of Homo sapiens in the Pleistocene to the, to the development of urban societies in the late Holocene. He has authored nearly 100 peer-reviewed scientific papers, the monograph Tropical Forests in Prehistory, History, and Modernity, published in Oxford University Press, and a popular book, which I hope a lot of people will read, uh, Jungle, How Tropical Forests, Forests shape the world in us. And I think that's very apl applicable here to the Philippines. So Patrick has also taken part in UNESCO Conservation Symposia and currently leads the ERC starting grant Pantropocene that is investigating the degree to which pre-colonial and colonial impacts on tropical forests influenced earth systems on continental and planetary scales with legacies for the 21st century. He, he holds an affiliation with the University of Queensland and the University of the Philippines Diliman and he is the co-founder of the Pantropica Research Network. So uh, without further ado, let us all welcome uh, Dr. Patrick Roberts. Yep, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for the kind invitation to, to give a talk to you all today. Um, I thought I would give everyone a, a brief introduction to, to the Pantropocene um, project that was just mentioned. Um, this, this is an ERC. Um, projects, but it but it has a, a formal link to to the University of the Philippines with with Dr. Grace Barreto Tesoro. So it is a, a project that perhaps you've you've all heard a little bit about. Um, and you know, um, I thought it'd be great to present it, and and then everyone can see you know if they if they might like to be involved um, in it as well. So you might have heard of the term the Anthropocene, which is being increasingly used, um, I think, in, in popular circles, in the media, and in, in various academic disciplines. Um, the origins of the Anthropocene is hotly debated. At its most basic, it refers to the fact that humans are having a dominating impact on a series of Earth systems. So this includes things like the lithosphere and, and, and geological um, bases, um, the biosphere, so the world's plants and animals, the atmosphere, obviously, in the form of, of carbon emissions and other emissions that we hear so much about, um, the hydrosphere and the cryosphere. Um, it is debated the degree to which geologists have proposed this is a formal epoch, um, which they see, usually they see that that either begins with the start of the Industrial Revolution in Western Europe um, with increased fossil fuel burning or um, with um, 
the the 1950s and an increase in in things like plastic production as well as nuclear bomb testing. Um, in the social sciences, there's been a bit bit of pushback there to the idea that it could be limited to just this period, um, with people arguing that perhaps it's better to look at long term processes of how humans became tied into um, uh, systems. And also in the context that a sort of geological Anthropocene um, is often kind of used to suggest that all humans are responsible for these problems um, and therefore all humans should have to fix them. Um, whereas the social sciences would increasingly point out that actually a lot of these changes have been a result of incredibly imbalanced global socioeconomic systems um, that really have to be taken into account. So the, the term remains contentious. Um, and in, in this talk, I'm, I'm really going to be using it as a kind of um, a framework, if you like, and, and taking the longer term perspective on, on what it means for humans to impact uh, systems. And within this tropical forest, um, I would argue a, a critical to any discussion of uh, the Anthropocene. Um, today, deforestation across the tropics is, is the third biggest source of carbon emissions on the planet. It's bigger than the entirety of the European Union. Um, for example, um, they're home to over half uh, of the world's plants and animals, which means that if any kind of biodiversity changes occur uh, in tropical forests, they're going to have knock on effects for the entire planet um, and its biota. Um, they're also responsible because of the degree of the strong degree of evapotranspiration. They also result in about 60% uh, of the planet's um, terrestrial rainfall. And if, again, if they're to disappear, this not only makes the regions in which they exist drier, um, but also has knock-on effects for, for climate systems more widely. So taking a longer term perspective then on, on what tropical, when tropical forests and human interactions with tropical forests um, began, um, tropical forests have often been framed as these kind of blanks on the map for for the origins of our species and the dispersal of our species, they've often been seen as barriers. Um, in the context of agriculture and urbanism, they've often been seen as, as kind of really quite unattractive and, and, and sort of prone to societies collapsing, if you like, and, and fading back into, um, into tropical forests. But the last sort of decades, uh, decade or so um, of, of, of increasing multidisciplinary approaches have shown that actually tropical forests have gone from kind of this perception of ruins to something with the aid of, of methodologies like LIDAR a bit more like this, that actually underneath these forests and even within these forests, um, there is a massive record of human presence, uh, human management. Um, the Amazon really encapsulates this, I guess, with increasing discussions that actually the majority, there are a series of dominant trees in the uh, Amazon that make up about 80% uh, of all tree species. Um, and almost all of them are useful to humans. And it's increasingly thought that actually through things like tending and, and um, utilization of, of certain particular food tree species um, that humans may have, may have actually had a significant influence across that entire biome that we so often see as, as this kind of natural pristine area. In the context of human interactions with tropical forests, some people have even gone so far as to say that the Anthropocene began uh, in the context of past social and economic interactions uh, with these ecosystems. Um, so this, this is a particularly famous example that you may or may not have seen um, with the context that um, when Europeans arrived in the Neotropics, they not only brought themselves, but they brought um, diseases like smallpox, for example, that indigenous communities did, had not been exposed to before. Um, and while, you know, there'd long been an assumption of in places in the Amazon, for example, that societies were very small um, or, or that um, urban societies had, had failed, it turns out that this is actually just the, the product of us viewing this after this process. It's now estimated that nearly 90% uh, of the indigenous population uh, in the tropical Americas died within a hundred years of European arrival uh, as a result of these diseases, as a result of murder, uh, and as a result of policies like um, resettlement that actually exacerbated this um, still further. Um, and it's, it's considered now with that kind of revised um, estimate of how many people lived there um, prior to European arrival, 
um, that actually the, the deaths of all of these people would have led to such a significant regrowth of forest that it would have absorbed carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and that this is recognizable uh, in global ice core records and may even have catalyzed the Little Ice Age. Now, this, this latter part, this latter hypothesis is still hotly debated. Um, the, the, the huge mortality is, is of course, not, um, not debated, um, but it, it shows you how ideas, how tropical forests have been seen as, are now seen as so key and, and human interactions with tropical forests are seen as so key to potential early human interactions um, with our systems. And so what the Pandropocene project sort of seeks to do um, is to look at when did tropical land use first start to have regional and global impacts on environments and societies? Um, how did this vary across space and time? Um, and how did this leave legacies that may even still be operating on societies today? To do this, it, it takes the, the former Spanish empire as a kind of framework. Um, it does this because this was in many ways the first pantropical empire um, the first empire to sort of administer land um, in different parts of the tropics, particularly once it eventually um, united with the Portuguese empire uh, as a result of, of, of succession in Iberia. Um, but um, it, it also covers critical biomes that, that where a lot of this debate has been happening in the Amazon basin, in Central America, the Caribbean uh, and South America. But of course, the Spanish Empire also includes the Philippine uh, archipelago um, in what was to become the center of the Spanish East Indies. And while a lot of questions, a lot of attention has been placed on the Americas in the context of, of uh, early, not only early indigenous management of forests, but also how that changed following European rival, um, taking this as a framework allows us to actually then compare what's happening in a very different context um, and to see the extent to which there may truly be kind of global as well as regional signals uh, of human interactions with tropical forests. So yes, so this is. Um, the Philippines both across, across this timescale is, is, is also a key um, region for looking at, at these questions. So prior to European arrival, one of the most significant um, things that is thought to potentially have influenced human interactions with our systems in the tropics is the arrival of, of agriculture. Um, rice agriculture has been seen as signif particularly significant. Um, and there was a paper by Dorian Fuller and colleagues that actually argued that the expansion of rice agriculture and the expansion of water buffalo management um, actually resulted in late Holocene uh, methane emissions that are observable. Um, not only that, but sort of ever since um, some of the first discussions of rice agricultural expansion into Southeast Asia, there's been perceptions that if you have rice agriculture, you must have extensive deforestation, um, which in turn would perhaps lead to also um, significant uh, systems changes. And so landscapes like Ifugao in the Philippines um, are seen as, as critical to sort of exploring this. Um, although, as we now know, the Ifugao terraces were most likely um, produced by indigenous populations following um, Spanish arrival. But it still remains an important area for looking at how rice, um, other types of animals, pigs, um, arrive um, in, in tropical forests. Um, and then also subsequently, um, what happens following European arrival uh, in this context, what new animals are introduced, um, things like cattle, sheep and goats, how did they impact um, uh, systems here and of course the sheep and goats may even there is debate actually that this may even occur earlier than than, than European arrival may be linked to um, um, other exchange networks now um, and then following um, Spanish arrival how did things like changes in administration um, in resettlement of, of indigenous populations or perhaps even the arrival of diseases how did these things impact tropical land use in the Philippines and, and human societies uh, in the Philippines? Was it in a similar way to what happened in the neotropics? Were there differences? Um, and what ultimate consequence did this have um, for um, tropical forests? So this is a paper we published right at the start of the project led by Noel Amano, um, um, where, where he, he really outlines um, our knowledge or existing knowledge of, of the arrival of different plants and animals in the Philippines um, and how 
land use may have changed over time or how different economic strategies may have changed over time. And that's in the Holocene journal. So the, the, the Spanish empire, I think also, um, we can also build up something of a temporal framework to look at these questions. Um, we, we have a workshop um, briefly going on at the moment that, that sort of debates the, the correct the, or the best periods to look at in this regard, but, but to take a broad um, brush um, approach across the area. We, we, we want to look at, you know, kind of pre-European arrival. What is the maximum indigenous land use um, in the Philippines, but also in different parts of the Spanish empire? What impacts did this have on, on forest cover or natural forest cover, if you like? Um, how did this then change at around, you know, by 1600 when the Spanish have arrived across these different parts of the, the tropics? Um, how did diseases um, impact populations there? How did new trade systems um, impact how land use was formulated? Moving a bit further to 1700, probably more correctly now 1800. Um, how did the introduction of, of things like cattle, of, of sheep and goat, as well as new administrative laws um, through time, how did they change tropical land use um, and settlements in places like the Philippines? And what did this mean um, for tropical forest cover and land use? And then finally, how does this all compare to um, industrialized land use um, that then kicks in, um, you know, but in by the 1900s. The project itself is designed into into three work packages. So work package one is is really looking for primary data. So when and how did major pre-industrial transitions in human tropical land use occur in the Philippines, and how did that compare to other parts um, of the empire? And work package two. Um, trying to actually then map these to produce land use maps, which I'll come on to a little bit in the future, to give us a spatial estimate of, of what this land use actually looked like, um, so that we can then put this into work package three, which basically try, wants to take maps of land use from the past to see if they impact climate models. Do they impact precipitation models, soil models, temperature models? Could human land use uh, at different stages in the past have been significant enough to have altered Earth systems? And what does this mean for, for land use occurring today? So Work Package 1 is really trying to take a very multidisciplinary approach that includes um, a range of things from archival work, um, so with, with various partners, um, uh, postdocs here in Yenna, but also partners in the Philippines, um, at the University of the Philippines at, at Ateneo, um, to really try and look at um, what, what is the evidence for different changes in land use um, and, and their impact on forests uh, in the archives that exist? Um, remote sensing using this, this LIDAR methodology that's really revolutionized what we can see uh, on the surface of the ground in tropical areas. Um, I'll come back to that briefly in a minute. Um, things like archaeobotany, archaeozoology, looking at what plants and animals were present in different sites and how this changed over time. Um, historical or, or historical ecology, botanical survey, to see if the existing vegetation, is there anything in, in, in vegetation that exists uh, in areas that suggests something about past human influence? Paleoenvironmental coring of, of lakes um, to, to try and see, you know, how did vegetation change over time? And is that linked to human activities? Um, and then excavation as well, being led by, by people like um, Dr. Grace Beretta Tesoro. Um, so just to briefly just focus on, on paleo environmental cause, for example, we've had this paper, uh, Hamilton et al. Um, in Nature, Ecology and Evolution. And what this paper wanted to do was actually just summarize the existing paleoecological records that exist uh, in the Philippines, but also in, in the wider um, called a sort of um, Pacific region or, or Pacific region that came under um, Spanish uh, um, influence. Um, this wasn't, this was based entirely on existing pollen records, existing charcoal records. And we wanted to see basically, do we see this, this kind of expected regrowth of forests that, that has been argued in the neotropics um, as a consequence of um, European arrival? Um, and we did also, we did test that hypothesis using pollen records in, in the Americas as well. And so in the Americas, what we found is that um, we do see this, this regrowth of forests in some cases, but obviously in other cases, um, land use could also be lead to deforestation, right? If, if even if you have this big indigenous mortality, um, if, if Europeans arrive and start clearing the land or, or 
building new settlements, then that will also lead to, to deforestation. And so actually what we found is that there isn't this homogeneous forest regrowth, but actually the responses varies depending on the local social and ecological uh, and economic situation. Um, and this is also what we found um, in, 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 in the region in, in um, East and Southeast Asia and Micronesia uh, in these island contexts. In some cases we did see um, a sort of forest regrowth and evidence for um, significant population declines. This is indicated by a red line here. So there is documented population decline as a result of disease uh, in, in the Philippines as well. Um, and this is also seen in, in um, Sulawesi, um, North Taiwan, and various of these islands. This is all documented in archival records. Um, but again, we see that the responses of the forest is, is quite different, and it depends on where the lakes exist. Um, and one thing to really point out, I think, is that for the Philippines, um, there are relatively few records that have the temporal resolution to look over this, this pre and then, and, and then Spanish period with Powai Lake being, being one, um, Bulalukau is another example. And so one aim of this project is to really try and get further paleoenvironmental records that are really detailed, that cover this time period to look at um, responses in different parts of the Philippines to, to this, this period. Um, LIDAR, as I mentioned, it's really, you know, you might have seen the work in Greater Angkor in Cambodia. Um, it's really had a, a huge impact on, on what we understand um, past urbanism in the tropics to be, but also the extent of, of past settlement. Um, it basically involves the sort of um, firing of lasers from an airborne vehicle um, down onto the ground. And because it's doing this millions and millions of these lasers, some can even break through the canopy to the forest floor and then um, come back up to the aircraft to build a picture of what's down there. Um, and using certain algorithms, um, this can then be stripped away. Um, the, the canopy can in effect be stripped away in the model to show what's lying underneath as is kind of shown here. Um, and this, this has been used uh, in the Philippines to, to look at um, water drainage um, courses so far to, to try and get an assessment of natural hazard management, but it hasn't been used in an archeological context yet. And so one thing we want to try and do um, is apply this methodology to, to actually look at um, past landscapes to see if it can enrich our knowledge of, of what's there. So looking at things like um, past Spanish landscape modifications, field systems, um, settlements, um, and um, as well as as well as probably perhaps um, in indigenous um, settlement systems as well. So this is kind of one part of the project that we're looking to to explore the utility of lidar in this context in the Philippines as well. Um, so yes, this is just an example here to, to look at, you know, in a case of field systems where it, it can be used to kind of, often, often in certain areas in Europe, we might just use aerial photography because the land is, is um, perhaps the vegetation is, is, is gone. Um, but in, in cases where we do have, you know, a, a significant vegetation cover left, this, this method can greatly improve what we can see um, on the floor. Okay, and, and so moving from work package two, the idea is to put this novel data that we collect as well as um, data that already exists into um, a land use map, into a model, um, which basically involves taking, you know, estimates of what the economy was like at different points in time and, and population was like, to then give a, a sense of, of what land use looked like um, in the Philippines, but also perhaps across the, the Spanish Empire more widely um, at different points in the past. Uh, on the right-hand side, I've just showed you what exists currently. Um, these are land use maps um, for the past. These are by climate specialists, basically. These are almost entirely based on just assumptions, um, re really from an environmentally deterministic perspective with the idea that, um, you know, um, based on this environment, um, only this number of people could live there practicing a very standardized uh, life way. Um, there's basically no archeological or historical input into these models, which is why you can see that, I mean, the Hyde one, um, the, this is sort of a, let's say a late Holocene um, model it's supposed to be. As you can see in the Hyde example, it's pretty terrible. Um, we now know that, that obviously um, there was much more land use than is shown um, on that map. Um, and KK10 is getting perhaps a little bit better. We see things in Central America, North America, 
um, perhaps in South America too. Lots of um, predicted land use in, in India and, and mainland Southeast Asia. Um, but it's also terrible for places like the Amazon. It doesn't really capture our not new understanding um, of land use. And you can see that the Philippines is, again, basically completely um, just assumed to have very little land use. But so our, our, our efforts here are really to improve upon um, these maps to get a better sense of social and economic impacts on land use. Um, and at the moment, we're, we're just discussing how to do this for the Philippines, but this basically involves um, taking an approach where we have to categorize land use into different types um, that are of different intensity, so ranging from hunting and gathering um, through to different types of animal management, plant management, um, that can then basically be mapped in this form. This is from a, a, a recent paper on the project. I don't think it's quite published, but it is accepted. Um, by Finley et al, um, involving um, also Stephen Acabado and, and, and Grace and, and Noel as well. Um, and what this tries to do is really um, give a sense of land use in, in Ifugao, um, in one part of Ifugao, um, between 1570 and 1800. Um, and this is in the form of a circle diagram, and this was designed um, by um, some, some sort of earth system scientists with interest in archaeology. And what the circle diagram is supposed to show is varying intensities of land use from the middle, which is very high. So the settlement has the highest land use or intensity um, moving outwards. So into things like, in this case, rice terraces being the next intensity, um, active um, swin fields, fallow swin fields, um, pasture land um, and agroforestry and, and hunting and gathering on, on the outside. Um, and what we found in this case is, is if we take um, the arguments of Stephen Acabado for changes in, in land use, basically the idea that by 1800, you have extensive um, rice terraces that, that weren't really um, being used for rice uh, in, in 1570. Um, you can actually have a doubling of the population here um, without actually increasing your area of land use. Um, and this is because rice terracing is so productive. Um, and not only that, but also because evidently in contrast to perhaps the classic Western view of what rice agriculture means, is that this kind of Muyong Pio system involved the maintenance of forest as well as these rice terraces, because there was obviously a clear acknowledgement that not only that was needed for resources, but it would have also held the soil in place to reduce soil erosion. Um, and so this, this I think was quite interesting um, in getting a sense of, of how we can use models like this to explore questions of impacts on, on forest cover um, and, and land use through time. And the eventual idea of this um, is to map these types of land use for the Philippines and other parts of the Spanish empire um, at different time slices. In our cases, we're aiming for those four time slices that roughly match up with what I started the talk with. Um, this is just an example from West Africa where this type of method has been applied um, to look at changes through time. Um, so the idea to actually take sort of generalized land use types and map them because this is then a, something that we can actually put into um, the climate model. So yeah, which takes us to then work package three. The idea is that if you can create that map, of course that map we have to accept will be inaccurate. We will never get an exact map or at least maybe for more recent periods, but we really will struggle to get a map that, that is um, totally accurate. But can we produce a best approximation of land use and how it changed through time, through these times, these have now changed, but to take into account the, the Philippine um, context, but can we get maps for different um, sort of time slices that represent major land use changes and how do they impact then um, these different models through time? And the idea is to design these, these time periods, to design this, this, this to, to really be able to assess how did different technology change land use? The, you know, how did things like iron um, um, technology change land use? How did novel different changing types of technologies different types of farming um, also change how did a transition from a subsistence life way to a focus on event what was to what were to eventually become plantation like systems um, through time how did that impact land use and, and earth systems in the philippines and beyond and how did changes in administration in, in how settlements were thought of and, and um, um, dictated how did that change? And of course, within that, we have to also, within this whole thing is see how indigenous resistance in turn um, was significant in, in, in you know, perhaps stopping or changing 
some of these changes that in turn uh, may have had a uh, systems consequences as well. Um, the project team is, is incredibly diverse. It includes you know, a really permanent close partnership with the University of the Philippines. So hopefully you've all heard um, a bit about it and the opportunities that, that are available to, to students within ASP and, 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 and beyond. Um, but there are also linkages to, to the Australian National University. Now increasingly in the Philippines, even more partners like Ateneo, University Partido State University as well. Um, and partners in Cebu um, as well. So this is really, um, you know, both a sort of um, extensive project across the Philippines, but also with a lot of global partners um, as well. Um, why have I shown this one? Ah, yes. Um, and the idea being that, um, you know, if we can produce this data for the Philippines, that 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 some of which already exists for many parts of the Americas, we can start to really look at different experiences across these, these different time periods, um, both of, of people living in the tropics, but also of tropical environments and what that might mean um, for today as well. And so already in this Hamilton et al paper, we didn't just include the kind of area I showed you, but this did in fact also already try and compare to pollen records that we have um that exist in the americas as well and so while this was was not fully complete because there's a, a sort of relative lack of records it perhaps gives a useful framework for moving forward um that once we can apply these same methods the same kind of project design in different parts of the world in different parts of the spanish empire in this case that we can try and then build up comparable um data sets to look at these questions um and yes ultimately you know what the important thing is, is to really try and improve on these global models that are being used to look at how human land use has changed the planets through time um, and really try and come up with more detailed models that take a strong social um, sciences approach that bring the data we have from archaeology and history together to perhaps build um, better, better informed um, maps of these kind of processes. So just to finish then, um, uh, as was mentioned at the start, uh, if anyone would like to read a little bit more about, I've, in this talk, I've, I've focused mainly on, on Pantropocene, but my work more widely has, has tried to look at how um, perceptions are changing of, of human interactions with tropical forests um, in the deep past, um, as well as in the more recent past. And if anyone would like to read a little bit more about it, there's, there's this book by Oxford University Press, um, which really focuses on our, our species and, and the growing evidence for our species interaction with tropical forests um, through time. Although I will say it, it, it's pretty um, obscenely expensive as many academic books are. So perhaps better is, is as was also mentioned, um, is that there's now um, um, a more popular book, um, which takes the whole span of from the very first tropical forests on our planet in the Carboniferous era, through tropical forests and dinosaurs, uh, the first mammals, um, hominins, and then also as well, our species interaction with these environments through um, our evolution, our dispersal, um, agriculture, urbanism, uh, the colonial period and, and the legacies that are left today. And so this, this book is currently in hardback form. Um, actually in July of this year, it will also come back in, in paperback form and, and be even more um, you know, accessible in, in, a, in a cost sense as well. So anyway, I just thought I'd leave those up in case anyone's interested in reading more um, from perhaps um, a more global um, perspective on some of these questions. Um, yeah, and, and so thank you. Thank you for letting me introduce um, the project. Um, as mentioned, this, this of course wouldn't be possible um, without all of our wonderful partners. Um, I can't show everyone on this slide. Um, I think some of you are even in in this room, um, but just to, to highlight some of the main people here, including Grace, uh, Stephen, uh, Ruel, Francis Gialogo, um, as well as Greg Bankoff and, and Rebecca and Max, who are postdocs uh, on the project, um, Janelle, who's done some work in the Philippines um, and, and is now at ANU, and, and Jed Kaplan, who's helping with the, the, the land use mapping as well. So thank you very much. Um, and yeah, let me know if you have any, any questions as well. All right, thank you very much, Patrick. And thank you for sharing that. I'm sure there's a lot of questions and there's going to be a lot of uh, discussion as well. So if anyone wants to uh, add or wants to add, ask any questions, you may, uh, you can put your questions on the 
chat box or you can also re have a reaction put on a press the reactions button okay if you can't find the reactions button it's on the for we people who are using windows uh, i'm sure that uh it it should be at the bottom so just play around all right um i guess we can also ask some questions here um maybe i can ask well, at, at what stage are you already in your in your project patrick yeah i mean that's a difficult one unfortunately the project started just as as COVID hit um so you know we were planning things like having a workshop in person in the philippines and and, and doing lots of field work which sadly just hasn't been possible yet um nevertheless um work package one so as you can see thanks to great work of people like noel um we've already managed to do a review paper that kind of hopes to to compile the existing knowledge so we managed to produce that um we have in the last year managed to do a trip to do some archival work in the in in um, the usa um to see what records are there um so that became possible um with um partners in in Potida state university and in cebu we've started to do some paleo environmental coring um in the philippines as well unfortunately we haven't been able to come but i think that's probably better for for, for for, um, in the context of not transporting COVID around the world. Um, and, and so we've tried to come up with solutions that, that allow us to do bits and pieces. And we're hoping that from next year, we'll actually be able to do um, more field work. We, we have been, you know, we're, we're able to get an extension, um, which, is, which is good. So we can, we can sort of keep this work going. Um, I believe there have been, you know, various students um, supported, but there are still, I think, a couple of student positions um, available for people that that might be interested in doing some work and having their project supported. Um, yeah, um, it, it, so so perhaps not as far al along as we'd like to be, but but I think we're still you know we're we're trying our best yeah. in in the current um, situation. All right, and uh, well, good luck for that. Uh, I still have more <laughs> questions, but um, yeah, uh, we have two people here uh, raising their hand. Uh, first, I'll call on Dr. Miharis, and then Dr. Paz will follow. So, uh, Sir Mandy? I open. Uh, yeah. Okay. I have no video. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you, uh, Patrick, for this uh, great uh, uh, discussion. I have just a few comments now. You, you said that you were referring, of course, to the Ifugo project, mm -hmm. that uh, terraces must, must likely be colonial. No? I don't really agree with that. No, Maybe the high terracing is colonial, but terracing has been there since the Oceanation came in. And that's the problem with the Fugao is that it's just in the center of the Lieras. Uh, but you look at the, 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 the terracing of the south, the Beloys are very different from them. And you have to look also on the Kalingas, which is actually where the size Kagan River. So they have different experiencing. And to tell that, that this colonial is really, I uh, really don't, don't agree. You know? Maybe high terracing, yes. But terracing has been there for a long time. Uh, I believe that at least Australians have brought it in. You know? Mm -hmm. Although rice per se have been problematic, uh, been, and, and Victor will probably agree with me, that the initial colonization of Australians bringing in rice around 2500 did fail. No? It, and it was only, uh, I think rice was only viable by 2500. No? Hmm. One major thing is that it's very rarely uh, uh, cited work by uh, a, a, a new uh, geologist, no? hmm. uh, Rose Berdin, who's which studies actually studies are uh, uh, the changing behavior of Enso before 2500, which have a big impact on the environment. No, before mm. between 7500 and 2500, Enso is uh, in, uh, infrequent but prolonged, meaning mm. you have a 10 year Enso, which behavior changed after 2500, where in Enso becomes regular every three years, but short, no? I think that would have a big impact on, on the environment and even human uh, uh, adaptation. No? That's why we, I, I believe that when, when Sunnis arrived, uh, there was a failure of rice because mm. of this var varying environment. It wants, if you have 10 years drought, your seed stock won't, won't last long. Mm. It's mm. only up to 2,500 when rice become more uh, dominant, no? Mm -hmm. And I guess uh, Victor Pass would agree also with me that uh, maybe during that time, they have to shift to something else, like mm -hmm. uh, alata, basically alatas or, or the yams. No? Uh, mm -hmm. Because even in my sites in Kalo Cave, uh, we're in a lot of Asunisian materials, but no domesticated rice, no rice at all. 
Mm-hmm. So rice was very problematic. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, so those, those two points I think, I think uh, uh, need to be viewed. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Yeah, no, thank thank you so much for your call. First of all, it's a real honor to, to hear from you after seeing, you know, all your work, your amazing um, work. So so thank you for taking the time to, to come and, and um, um, give those give those comments. Yeah, sorry, I should have said in terms of the terracing, of course, there is these earlier terraces, even in Ifugao, you know, that, that may, that, the, the debate being whether they're used for, for rice or not, that, that perhaps being used for taro earlier. Um, and, and what we're trying to look at now is, yes, exactly. Where is terracing else in the Philippines? Um, before this time um, so we are trying to take that into account but we'd love to chat to, to you more as well as as we try and put together um, these models and that's also a really great um, interesting point about rice um, um, as well about how the climate may have infected how that was that was taken up um, yeah so no I mean if, 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 if you'd be interested we'd love to chat chat to you more as well and get your input on on these these perhaps maps as, as we as we put them put them together Okay, uh, thanks for that, uh, Sir Mandy. And I'm sure that there's also a lot more to ask. Uh, I think Dr. Victor Pass is raising his hand. Maybe you can, uh, I think you can turn on your video, Sir Vic. Yeah, I'm trying. Ah, okay. Is it on already? I don't yes, see sir. myself. <laughs> so, Patrick, um, thank you for doing this and thank you for giving us a wonderful overview of your of the project. And I think it, it's uh, Grace is the right person to be at the at the forefront from our end at the ASP to uh, col- for this expanding collaboration. In fact, uh, I, pardon my, I'm really just an absent-minded fool, but uh, I just, uh, I just uh, um, replied to Dr. Martin and uh, about her, and yes, of course, it's exciting uh, collaboration. Now listening to your overview, I now uh, understand it much better what, uh, she wants to uh, achieve. Now, mm. first, uh, I agree with, with uh, Manny. In fact, uh, about the terraces, uh, Bubu is not wrong, you know. But you know, the problem with the sociology of the rice, of the Ifugao rice terraces history, it was sent. That was everything was centered on the Ifugao rice terraces to answer antiquity, you know, origins, etc. But of course, it's not. No, it's so. While Bubu is right, the technology of Terracing, it must be much older, mm. and the and the best place to look, and we're lucky this time because we have a young a, a, a new student who come who came in with a background in agriculture and who uh, grew up in the in the Cordillera, and who mm. just came back from Bakun, and Bakun is in the west uh, is in the western side of the Cordillera, where Mandy and I when we were much younger and fitter. Um, uh, uh, surveyed and really found uh, poss- the strong possibility of older terraces there. Mm. So maybe the project should uh, so work. It's still a, a bit hard to get to, no, but that's if we're going if we're going to look for older examples of abandoned terraces, mm. that would be a good place to go. I used to mm. believe that the terraces were first uh, created, constructed for uh, non cereal agriculture, but now I think it is uh, hand in glove with the um, introduction of cereal agriculture in the islands, you know, in islands of Asia. Mm. And uh, now Dorian and company, have, they have a new paper uh, where, you know, you know, those guys, they're very cheeky, but they argue <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, well, you see, it's not the wet rice agriculture that's driving all this expansion and landscape change, but it's the dry land, the dry agriculture, uh, dry rice types, which is, of mm. course, connected to Sweden, right? Which mm. means uh, this correlation between um, <laughs> that methane and rice agriculture and then the change in the, well, Anthropocene is um, maybe not uh, that strong anymore. You know? and, mm. uh, and, uh, and, and which now brings me to my main comment, really, which mm-hmm. I think uh, I love this idea of the this this uh, coinage of anthropocene because I think this is a better uh, framework than arguing till we're blue against geology in mm-hmm. their epoch in their new epoch anthropocene. We mm-hmm. have no position really to tell them how to <laughs> define a geological 
but uh, epoch you know and, mm-hmm. and they have a they have a golden uh, mark for that right and yeah. that's their that's their periodization mm-hmm. then let's let's you know let's not even use that anymore huh? pantropocene is equally valid mm-hmm. and i think mm-hmm. this is e- really something that's really more for us if you mm-hmm. ask me so i i think uh, <laughs> let's just stick to that and and don't even <laughs> mention Anthropocene because it doesn't really matter too much. Yeah. Now I notice in your periodization too, in your in the facing, that you uh, you missed out the 1800s, mm-hmm. and I think that is crucial for your project because mm-hmm. in between your 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 ranches, your rancherias, and then the um, the uh, intensification of logging and uh, and uh, and um, agriculture uh, uh, in um, in uh, the American period in the 1900s, the uh, liberalization of the economy of the Spaniards uh, led to uh, expansion of, of haciendas and cash mm-hmm. crop economy. And cash crop economy are monocultural landscapes. landscapes. So they were mm-hmm. really cutting forests you know, and, and mm-hmm. everything. And so that will be, that surely that will have a signal. In, uh, in in this part of the world. Now, uh, mm-hmm. let me then introduce also one for Rofes, who, with colleagues in Mexico, will have a parallel uh, project. They're starting a parallel tr- uh, project, but very mm-hmm. specific to uh, animals that were brought, that were um, trans- transported from, from, uh, from the Americas to the Philippine mm-hmm. Islands via the Galleon trade. You know? Mm-hmm. But I'll stop, stop there, and maybe one would want to say something about that. So these are mm-hmm. all uh, interlocking research, uh, uh, research that's, that are all very exciting and will, uh, will benefit from each other, I think. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks so much for your input. It's, it's great to hear from, from you as well, you know, having, having read all of, all of your stuff too. Um, yeah, I mean, the rice is particularly interesting. I mean, Ma, Ma, Ma Ting, who you mentioned, she, she in, in southern China has explored this question of, um, you know, does rice expand in the, along the floodplains first, actually, you know, that there is this change in sea level and, and the climate that Mandy mentioned that, and perhaps that's the same also, well, presumably the same in the, in the Philippines that rice probably, you know, as you say, we're we're focusing on Ifugao, but rice presumably arrives, you know, via via floodplains or via rivers. One would think first, perhaps, right? Um, and so, how how can we try and explore that and, and map that appropriately? Um, but yes, we're definitely trying to see what we can what we can do um, in in that regard. It's interesting. I haven't seen that more recent Dorian paper. It's funny. Yeah, that it, now- it just <laughs> came out about maybe well during the pandemic, and then uh, okay. you so know how those guys are. They- they yeah. publish like mad, you know. Yeah. So he's he's contradicting his earlier argument now. Yes, so. indeed. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, hey, by the way, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for just, yeah. uh, interrupting yeah. you, but uh, could you maybe it's you could send send some of your books our way. You know, our library is a very good library, and our, our students and will really yeah. benefit from from your your and if you write perhaps uh, Oxford Press. They'll uh-huh. send us a copy, you know, for the the ASP library. Yeah, They've for sure. Done it before, you know, so maybe they'll a word yeah, from no. you will uh will do the trick. Yeah, for sure. I'll I'll definitely I'll definitely ask them. Um, but either way, I, I I'm sure I, I will bring one when I when I can hopefully come and meet you all in person one one day, then I'll I'll be sure to bring um bring them with and and in ter- just in terms of the phasing as well. Yeah, sorry, the the phasing on this was kind of. Um, from the beginning at this kind of empire wide scale, but but since then we've adapted it to one instead of 1700, it will now be about 1800 um, because of exactly what you you said. And, 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 and Juan, we have we have now been introduced and been talking to and, and his project is 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 fascinating, um, the, the animal transport. So, um, but yeah, I don't know if he has any input if he's here. Um, he's here. I saw his name. Uh, OK. Oh, yeah. There. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. Thank you so much for the, for the comments. Um, I'm sure we'll be in be in touch as well. To yeah, I have a, I have other questions and comments, but I'll reserve it for late. Let others okay. talk first. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I I think uh, there are other people who are who may also want to say something. Ah, okay. Here we yep. here is Doctor Juan. Um, can Can you hear me? 
Yes, sir. You can also turn ah, on okay, your okay. video if you want. Uh, oh, I cannot. Well, anyhow, I cannot explain maybe better for how to do it now, but <laughs> maybe I'm not allowed. <laughs> anyhow, but um, yeah, just to just to clarify, I think Grace already make a note that I am already collaborating uh, with with the project of the Panthropocene. I've been part of the, this workshop ongoing. We are uh, currently discuss, discussing ma ma many of these issues. So part of the presentation of Patrick was also we already seen there. So. Um, so yeah, so my, my project is uh, with, with the colleagues in Mexico are, are more focused on uh, trying to define what specific species, animals were brought from the new world or from even from Spain via the new world, but main, mainly the new world to Southeast Asia via Manila, the Philippines, and then went to Southeast Asia and expanded to Southeast Asia and vice versa. Right, so what species from the Philippines could have been uh, taken there? Animal, because we know kind of uh, we kind of have a good knowledge of what uh, what happened in the botanical part in the plants. Yeah, we know about well, soy, soy potato, cassava, uh, potato, and also ube taking the, the opposite road, for example, for example, right? But but for animals, we know for sure about the turkey, right? and about geese, but um, other animals is a big interrogation mark, right? When, when exactly and in, when, and in what proportions they, they were um, coming from the new world and what species were taken vice versa to there. So that's why we started this project with my colleagues from, uh, from Mexico, uh, INA, Instituto Nacional de Antropología e Historia, because uh, so we, we started one, one we will start with, by studying some colonial sites, starting with, with Mindanao, Batangas, a site studied by Grace, and a, a, a uh, site in, uh, in Camuros, kindly offered by, by Victor, to check in, one, uh, in what proportion we find their fauna that could have a clear or at least um, probable, likely origin from the new world and what species are local like Sus Filipinensis, for example, like, like dogs, um, horses also. So at least with this first approach, we will manage to see how much uh, imported or descendants of an imported fauna arrive and in which proportion they are using local fauna. And at some points, and at some point, we would like to contribute to the big project of, of of Patrick when we have more clear idea of what was happening and how these different faunas impacted uh, the environment in the Philippines. Right? That, that's more or less the, the plan. Okay, yeah, just wanted to clarify that and thank you, Victor, for, for bringing me, bring, bring me in. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, I, um, just in case, um, we're not, there's still some questions from Dr. Victor Pass, uh, but uh, are you still good, or do you, you might need to go? Um, I, I've got yeah, five five to ten minutes, and then I, then I have to go right. drop the kids off at school. But but until, until then, yeah, I could. Okay. Um, well, we can have another part two for this binado talk. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, maybe we can call Doctor Paz. I'm trying. Hold on. Oh, we can hear you. Yeah, you can hear me, no? Uh, but the video is not working, no? Can yes, you over? Okay. Oh, well, all right. So, Patrick, the I like that uh, that criticism of the green desert, and I think you're very much right about that. That the uh, that uh, as uh, as our colleagues in the working in the Amazon has demonstrated that the so-called virgin forest is not virgin really. There were uh, there are lots lots of signs of habitation in the even settlements in all mm -hmm. those newly opened uh, Amazonian forests because of cattle raising or whatever. Um, and, and, and the same, we see it in, in islands in island Southeast Asia. Uh, but, and I also like that idea that, uh, I didn't, haven't read that, but I'm sure it's in your book, that uh, they've uh, demonstrated also pinpointed that there are certain species of trees that uh, suggest that they were, um, uh, they were managed. 
And I think that is exactly what's happening in Ireland Southeast Asia. Mm-hmm. And really, the, that's why the uh, cereal agriculture is a, is a short road into the depths of, uh, of antiquity of human uh, landscape relationship uh, mm-hmm. and transformation in Ireland Southeast Asia. And, mm-hmm. and, and uh, but luckily we, we have all the tools and you, you have all the tools uh, uh, associated with this, with this project to really quiz the, uh, this kind of uh, much, much difficult way of, uh, of demonstrating um, the cultivation of, of trees no? mm-hmm. and, 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 and root crops, which uh, ethnographically, as you already know, in the Ifugao, for example, uh, you have a highly managed uh, forests, mm-hmm. and that's not really just for subsistence. It is integrated in, in their way of life, no? And mm-hmm. um, and we will see. Uh, we can predict that in in antiquity there are many variations of this mm-hmm. that uh, that will 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 tease out for from the richer data that will come out of it. So mm-hmm. I, I do like that and. Uh, I hope we, we you, I'm sure you have, you've it has crossed your mind, but I didn't see it in your presentation. Mm. The 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 role of the maritime landscape. Many mm. of our colleagues, well, there's a there's a cluster of colleagues. They're old. <laughs> they, most of them are just retired, but in the region who have been who have been um, documenting um, fish traps mm. uh, across the island Southeast Asia, coastal mainland Southeast Asia, Japan. And the Pacific, and uh, I think they published their work. I haven't seen it myself, no. But uh, Cynthia Sayas is at the, as, as one of the key researchers there. But the fact that they have fish traps, and then and and how they modify the landscape, and how they use use the tidal, the the long tidal um, uh, coast of many many islands, would mm. be an, an interesting uh, approach too. And um, mm. I think that's uh, something to think about. Yeah, thanks for that. that. That's that's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think actually LIDAR, um, although we, we haven't planned it for this project because it's still quite expensive, um, yeah. but there, there are increasing applications of looking using it to look at coastal modifications. As long as it's relatively right. shallow, it can actually yes. also. Um, so that that could be an interesting future yeah. avenue. I mean, there's loads of future future yeah. avenues, right? I mean, in the Amazon, there's this fascinating we're we're trying we're using um, We've we've got a project where we're using dendrochronology and DNA of, of Brazil nut mm-hmm. Brazil nut trees, um, and we can see that the the genome of this tree varies between um, basically parts of the Amazon that are linked to archaeological sites, and so right. it, it seems that actually probably although it's it's wild right it it's it's actually being shaped or its life history is being shaped by human um, um, activities in the past. So there's uh, you know I think. Um, there's a lot of fascinating work to do yeah. in different parts of the tropics now, um, and and it's really uh, relevant regionally because of the sea gypsies that mm. uh, ethnographically still exist in island in uh, in the Indian Ocean, and of mm. course across island Southeast Asia. And I think there, there's a strong correlation, and then v- variations of that from the past will uh, will will uh, will have remains of that, you know? and then we will yeah. see it in the, in the coral landscapes, you know. And the borings mm. of uh, post holes in the coral uh, flats mm. and all that stuff, no? Yes. Yeah. But right. maybe I won't be able to tell you this because if you're about to go and pick up your kids, but uh, <laughs> I give my regards to Noel and my love to Nikki. No, yes. Nikki around. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I will definitely mention that, 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 yes, I've seen you today. She'll, she'll be delighted, I'm sure. She'll be in, be in touch, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right. Um... Maybe as a final word, I wanted to mention as well that uh, I mentioned this to Grace while we were also part of the workshop. Uh, that the uh, I was I really like the circ- the design, the framework that you mentioned because. Uh, but I, I'm coming up from a different perspective because uh, I remember reading uh, a master's thesis by uh, uh, by Ed, uh, an anthropologist about the relationship of uh, sacred spaces. And the, there's more sacred spaces when you go to the forest as opposed to when you go to the house. So it's the same. And it was similar to the diagram that you showed. So it kind of explains a lot in terms of environmental and human uh, relationships. So uh, mm-hmm. I, which in, it's a different uh, uh, perspective as well. But mm-hmm. uh, I'm sure there's also still a lot of questions. I'm sure I, I have more questions. Uh, but uh, 
but uh, we will. I'm. We will. This is not the last time we will hear your talk. So I'm. We will invite you again. Um, and I think there's going to be another talk on May uh, about the Turkey. The the Turkey exchange. This is through uh, Dr. Rafes, uh, hmm. who invited his colleague to talk about uh, that. Um, all right, but thank you for this. And next week we will have maybe we will continue that colonial perspective, but with a different uh, question. Uh, Bobby Orellaneda from the National Museum will be talking about 300 years of maritime trade in the Philippines from 16th to 18th century, and that will kick off our uh, national our partnership with the National Museum. Uh, they, the archaeology division and the, the Much B will be having talks until. Uh, from next week until April 13. So wait for that. And if you want to know more, you can check out our Facebook page, uh, which Ara can also put here. Uh, if you have any questions, you can uh, email them to us or I think uh, Patrick's uh, email, you can easily find him and his uh, through his website. I think you have, you have a website. So I'm sure yeah. a lot of people are have questions regarding uh, opportunities and research questions and uh, partnerships, I, I suppose, I hope. Uh, and we can make this into a, a fun research. All right. Yeah, definitely. Thank you um, for having me. And yes, exactly. Please do email me if, if anyone has any questions or any more comments. Um, I'd love to hear from you. And, and hopefully from next year, we can we can come and, and see you all and, and and maybe give a talk and have a have a meeting in, in person. And I, I very much hope so. Um, so um, yes, thank you again for, for coming and listening. Um, yeah. <clears throat> thank you, everyone.